Hey guys, what's going on? I'm Ben Bateman. And I'm Andrew Guy. And we are the Action Guys. Wow. Wow, we, oh, both, we both did the... That was lame. That was... <laughs> <laughs> that could have been cooler, but it wasn't. Uh, I love how we, we just continue to keep doing this and make it... Hey, hey. I hope it's everyone's favorite part of the show, I, or one of their favorite. Maybe, maybe not the favorite. If part. If I'm everyone, then yeah. <laughs> uh, it was. It's a great way to start the show, guys. This is the action, guys. As those dick bags previously mentioned, um, <laughs> we talk about movies on this show. We and, absolutely uh, do here on the Collider Podcast Network, and uh, we have a very special show for you guys today. There's so much to talk about, but just so you guys know what the f we're talking about today, uh, we are doing the definitive ranking of every single Pixar movie today. There's 20 Pixar movies. Drew and I uh, did a did an exhaustive of ranking mathematical equation to get there. <laughs> nope, we didn't. But, <laughs> but, but well, the reason that this happened is because, well, <laughs> we actually just uh, we just sat down and started throwing darts at a dartboard with all these names on it. No, you recently had went through and watched every single Pixar film it that had all, ever yeah. been made. And um, with the Oscars coming up and, you know, Into the Spider-Verse is probably going to win the best Pretty animated clearly, yeah. animated film. But, you know, Pixar movies... Are usually always in contention. They're or at least kinda, there's usually one always there claiming it. And they're kind of the gold standard for what you make now in animated. Like all of like Illumination and all the other companies now. Um, Blue, Blue, Blue Island, Blue Sky. That's what it is. I have no Ferdinand. idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, they, uh, you know, these all all these companies kind of have have taken that formula and they make very profitable movies with great voice actors and often like I think the. I think that the formula to make a good animated movie is so easy now that as long as you have like a pretty good script, good animation, and some great writers, you'll make something at least above our average ninety percent of the time. Right, because like Boss Baby is a fun movie. Yeah, it's a good time. I actually enjoyed myself. I think it's a it's a well made animated film. But there is something to be said about those movies that really kind of separate themselves. And for the longest time, Pixar and DreamWorks were kind of going back and forth. You I mean, know, yeah, it was like we'll we'll kind of go slug into slug for slug, if you will. Yeah, we'll kind of go into all the history of, of the animated stuff and where where Pixar came from and everything in a second. But you're absolutely right. Around the time that Pixar started hitting home runs, it's like then DreamWorks jumped on, and then we mentioned Illumination, Blue Sky, Disney got back in the mix and started making some stuff outside of Pixar. Right, right. And now it's a very, very, very cluttered field. You know, you now you have any week. There's pretty much always going to be a big animated movie opening. It'll have. A-list talent just about every time. Yeah. And occasionally you'll get a movie like Wonder Park is opening this weekend or next weekend. I didn't even know what that movie was until like a week ago. I still don't know what that movie... What's Wonder Park? Mila Kunis is in it. There's billboards. At JFK, when I was I was got off a plane this morning and the, the terminal thing that... Is it animated? Is Walkway? that why you're saying it? Yeah, it was like all on the walls. Like they're always advertising a movie. I have no idea what you're talking about. One time I went, it was Peter Rabbit. One time I went, it was Mission Impossible. This time it was Wonder Park. So, huh. uh, you know, weird. But uh, in well, any case, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, well, I mean, the thing about animated movies and why you see one released all the time is they are massive cash grabs. Like, uh, middle, not middle of the country, but like Utah. I go to Utah every year, a couple times a year. My family lives there. And in Utah, they have the highest grossing theaters in the world. Not in America, not in wherever, not in Utah. The, the highest grossing theaters in the entire world are there. And because of that, they get the nicest theaters, the most technology in their theaters yeah. early on. And it's because there's so many Mormons there. And I know this is kind of weird, but think about it. They don't go to R-rated movies. Right. They don't go to bars. They don't go out drinking. They don't go to like rock concerts like crazy or rap concerts. I mean, they go to some, but it's like mostly what families love to do is go out to dinner and go out to the movies. Yeah. And animated movies, Pixar especially, that makes us a ton of money as a production company. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, so the formula is there now. And uh, we decided today that based on the success of that over such a long period of time and a few other cool ideas, we wanted to have the discussion, the definitive ranking. So the first question that we wanted to ask. And, and this is one that I think we're both kind of on the same page, but I'd like to pose it to you guys here, the audience, and think about this through the episode. Drew and I, I think, will kind of sound off at the end of the show what we feel. What is the true golden age of Pixar? Um, and I, in our estimation, there are three options. Um, and it would be 95 to 04, 2006 to 2011, or 2012 to 2018. And to kind of break down those years a little bit more closely for you, in, o f or in 95 to 04, we had, <clears throat> excuse me, Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2, Monsters, Incre or Monsters Inc., Finding Nemo, and The Incredibles. In order. In order. <clears throat> Excuse me. 06 to 11, Cars, Ratatouille, Wally, Up, Toy Story 3, and Cars 2. And 12 to 18 is Brave, Monsters U, Inside Out, The Good Dinosaur, Finding Dory, Coco, Cars 3, and Incredibles 2. Any era, I would be honored 
to be the producer and the studio behind. Classics. All of them have classics. Absolutely. All of them have some of the best Pixar movies uh, by a mile. There's only a few times in history that Pixar didn't have a movie come out since 95. The original run from 95 to 99 is probably the most sparse because 96, 97 don't have any movies. Uh, and, and then to you got to think back then, it was so hard. The animation was so much different. 2000, 2002 don't have movies, but pretty much from 2003 forward, there's almost a Pixar movie every year, save the good the good dinosaur getting pushed because of screenings, so there's no 2014 movie, right. and then there's just a weird break between Incredibles and Cars for some reason in 05. But um, any one of these periods can be amazing, and we will talk about each of these periods and why they're so good, but it's something to think about that Drew and I will kind of sound off on our opinion um, I don't think we have a live producer up in the booth, do we? I don't believe so. No, I would love to. Actually, we were talking to Cody. You yeah. guys know Cody. Cody uh, Hall. Yeah, Cody Hall. Uh, you feel free to sound off if you're there. I don't think you are. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we were talking with him beforehand. I asked him the question that we'll get to in a second here of uh, comparing Pixar against another major franchise. And it's like, you get people's attention when you ask questions about Pixar. Is I guess the point of the story. A hundred percent. People love talking about Pixar. Because they're arguably the best movies ever made that everyone has seen. Right? They're like the most palatable, like easily accessible. And, and I've been going back and watching some older stuff that I had never seen before in the old Disney canon. Like I recently watched Mulan for the first time. It's a great example of a movie that's pretty good. Uh, the and, best and parts. It's, it speaks strongly to nostalgia. Yeah. The best parts are great. But when you walk out of it, it's like the difference between watching Inside Out for the first time and watching that for the first time as an adult is like literally a joke. It's one of them is astronomical. One of them is like, Oh, that was kind of cute, and that had some fun moments, and that's great because you have a, a, f a female in the lead character, and it's not just a bunch of white people running around. That's all great and important, whereas you watch it inside out, and you're like, this is masterclass filmmaking. This is like the most brilliant, ingenious thing I've ever seen. I can't even believe somebody came up with this and made this actually watchable for a child. Well, what happened was, I'd say maybe around, <clears throat> I guess probably Wally was yeah. like the first really, really big one, where it was like, whoa. These this is heady. Yeah. These aren't kids' movies. Yeah. These are movies for adults that children can watch. That's what they really are. Yeah. They're not children's movies that adults can enjoy. These are movies made for adults that kids can also enjoy because what they start speaking on on a sociological and you know us as as a, as the human race and like they start talking about all these things that are so like you said heady and deep and layers that you don't get in the average kids' movie. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's, it becomes a different ball game, and that's and, and I feel like anything has to evolve. You know, you compare the original Toy Story to something like an Inside Out, and it's they're going for something very different. Yeah. Um, they have to, you know. But we will get to all of that. So that question of what is the golden age is one we want to ask you guys now, uh, Andrew. If the folks want to follow along with you in this conversation, want to tweet at you, where can they find you personally? You know what? You guys can find me at Andrew Guy on Instagram and Twitter, and you can find us at Team Action Show on Twitter. Yes, absolutely. You guys can find me at Ben Bateman Media. Twitter and Instagram, you know, uh, tweet at me there. Let me know your thoughts on this episode. We've been having a great time. Big shout out to Collider Podcast Network for having us on here, letting us do this show. Um, it's been such an honor to be part of this. There's so many great shows on here. So you can find us on the Movie Talk feed here on the Collider Podcast Network as well as there's a featured clip of this that will go up every single week uh, on the Collider Podcast's YouTube. They're doing uh, like targeted clips now of one segment from every show on that network. Yes. So you guys can find a clip of this show. And uh, as far as where the full video is going to exist someday, we're not sure. For right now, uh, you guys will have to download it on whether it's Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your downloadable podcasts. Yeah, make sure to go like, comment, subscribe on that YouTube channel, and then please, please find us on Spotify, Podcast One, Apple Podcasts, and download the show <clears throat> really quickly before we move forward. I want to go ahead and give a quick shout out to a team, a team of people called Action Industries, which is this thing that you and I have created, and they are working with us on building this brand. It's basically where you can find everything that Ben and I do. We've got social media platforms. You can find us on Instagram, you know, Action Industries on Instagram, and you can find us on Twitter through the Twitter I just said. But the shout out to the team here, I just want to say a few names very, very quickly. Billy Belford, Brandon Hanna, Daniel Sala, Emma McAllister, Eric Frederick, Hunter Ray Chambliss, James Spence, Caleb Coho, Liam Crowley, Matthew Kearns, Michael Blankenship, Paul Denuso, Richard Eric Jarvie, and Will McLean. Ben and I, we 
salute you. Thank you guys so much for your work in helping us build Action Industries as a brand. I would be remiss if I didn't point out that his name is Will McLean, like John McLean. Yes, this it was is true. It would point it out in a group chat this week. Yes, that was true. That's very true. But that group that he just referred to, that is the Action Advisory Board. That's helping us do all things action. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in the show. Um, but thank you guys all so much for helping us build this thing. We're really excited for the future. So... I want to kind of get into the next segment of the show. Yes. I think it's a fun conversation. Um, This morning, as I was, you know, uh, going through this outline that we're going off of right now, I started to think Pixar is kind of singular in the sense that they have 20 films, and the 20 Pixar films are pretty good. They're all pretty high quality. Some of them are absolutely amazing. Absolutely. The top half is at least they're all classics. And they were really just taking an established genre, the, the children's animated genre. They started a new studio, and they redefined what the quality level of that should be. Yeah. In my mind, going outside of one particular franchise where it's, you know, one set of characters in every movie, I was trying to think who else has ever done it in a short amount of time on the same level. Yeah, and there's really only one answer. And it's it's the, it's the MCU. The MCU, right? Both have at this point, coincidentally, twenty films. They're yeah. both twenty films and now one of them has taken twenty four years to get there, the other has taken eleven years to get there. But either way, both of these two studios have exactly 20 movies. And each one of them kind of has a few movies that you throw away or they're not your favorite or, you know, they're pretty good. But then they also have the ones in there that are like the greatest of all time in Infinity War, in Iron Man, in Winter Soldier, in Thor Ragnarok, there's, in Guardians. Like there's so many classics in there and there's only a few misses. There's not really any other entities or franchises or, or companies that have done that. Now, <clears throat> when you asked me this, I was like, well, what about Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, and Star Wars? And you're like, well, that's exactly what you're speaking on. That's that's like a confined group of characters in a universe. You know, it's not really the same thing as just taking the idea of comic books and yeah. making all these movies be that good. Yeah, you could you could make an argument that Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, those universes are the same because obviously the different trilogies feature different actors and right. they're referencing similar so, but like they still feel like they're all one big story whereas I don't think of the MCU quite the same way and the MCU was just done so intentionally. <laughs> well, but, you got to remember those books, there's one Lord of the Rings this and this and this and there's only X amount of Harry Potters whereas there's like a million Batman comics. There's yeah, a million right. Iron Man comics. So for them to pick and choose the best moments and create this, there's really only the two. So Ben and I will get into the ranking of our Pixar movies, the definitive Action Guys ranking of Pixar. But we, first, the mathematical solution <laughs> to the yes. exact 20. Uh, but before we do that, we are going to have this discussion. If you guys, Thanos snapped away one set of 20 films, one of them was just going to stop existing. You could never go back. You forgot they even existed. Would you give up the MCU or would you give up Pixar Once again, leave your thoughts below in the comments. Let us know what you think. If you want to hear the full discussion, go check out the full show on the uh, Collider Movie Talk feed. Uh, We're going to have this discussion right now. I think that I, Thanos, snap away the MCU. I know. So tough. I know. And I love that we're using a reference from the MCU (laughs) to keep Pixar around. But, dude, I can't. I can't get rid of the movies that... I mean, what? It's been it's been eleven years technically for the MCU, kind of like with Iron Man. We're in and, year eleven. Now. Yeah, exactly with Iron Man, and and you go back to to ninety five and Toy Story, and yeah, you know, I was seven when that came out. I've grown up with these movies, and and not only have I grown up with them, I've enjoyed them as a child and as an adult. That's what happens when you grow up. But like, you look at what they've done in this last this third part of their films, and with movies like Inside Out and and Wall-E, and and the, the way that they speak to you as an adult. I can't imagine the world would be a better place without these movies, whereas, like, I think the world would be okay without the MCU movies, whereas, like, they Pixar movies instill so much value, so much hope, so much love, so much joy. Teach they teach lessons. you so many great lessons. Yeah, yeah. And it's not to say that you don't get these things from Infinity War, but it's also, like, like you said earlier, it's done in such a palatable way. You could show these movies to anyone. No one would be offended. Everyone gets the greatness out of it, whereas, like, some people just don't like superhero movies. Yeah, it's a it's such a hard one. Um, I tweeted this out earlier, and and I'd like to actually share some of the responses, which I will in a second. But I want to make sure that I give my answer here first. Yeah, and I'm gonna fall on the other side of the coin. Here. I knew you would. It's close though. So I, I think the easy one here is that I don't connect with animated movies all that well. You uh, didn't watch them as much as as 
I honestly feel like most kids do. I mean, the era, the first era of Pixar, I watched almost every one of these movies as they came out. Like, um, I went to Lion King in the theater when you went to Heat in the theater. <laughs> well, okay, the early Disney stuff, yeah. the the class R golden age of Disney, right. so 89 through 95, I saw every one of them up to Pocahontas. So in, I saw, like as they were coming. Yes. Out, like you were okay. Like so my you sister were a loved, child at one point. Oh yeah. My sister <laughs> loved Little Mermaid, so I watched the crap out of it. Okay. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, we watched a ton. Aladdin was like my family's favorite. We watched it all the time. Um, Lion King, I loved as a kid. I was okay. a huge fan. Okay. It was Pocahontas forward that I stopped, um, which is when incidentally Pixar starts. So I do remember watching Toy Story One, A Bug's Life, Toy Story Two. And maybe Monsters Inc. in theaters, though I might have missed it. I definitely watched Incredibles in theaters. Yeah, most of the first run I watched. Um, so, but I will say, I think that the the world we live in today, enough of these other studios have an understanding how to make a quality animated movie. We'll continue to get really high quality animated movies from other studios, no matter how well these other studios seem to understand the success of the MCU. No one else seems to be able to do it. And it makes me sad to think that superhero movies without the MCU would nosedive back into a place where we would be getting the likes like of Joel even, Schumacher's. Even like the, just the Josh Trank Fantastic Four was just a few years ago. Right, right. Like you have <clears throat> the X Men movies, the best ones are pretty good. Like I like the best <laughs> two or three X Men movies quite a bit. But like X Men First Class as opposed to X Men First Class 3. <laughs> oh, X Men 3, la The Last Stand you're talking no, about? No, 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 no. What's the third one in the new trilogy called? Apocalypse? Yeah, X-Men Apocalypse. The, the the varying levels of quality from the first one to the third are astronomical. Did you like X-Men First Class 3? Uh, yeah, I just actually, when you said that, I just started thinking about, like, in 25 years, looking back at a picture of Oscar Isaac as Apocalypse, and us just being like, us just being like, why? What what happened? <laughs> like, why did that happen? But, uh, but yeah, that's what I'm, I'm saying, though. It's like, X-Men First Class is amazing, but X-Men Apocalypse is pretty pretty horrendous and also just like the notion that a movie as quality as logan gets hmm. enough acclaim like people like that movie but it also gets dismissed by a lot of people as just mediocre and that's like not even really a superhero movie that movie is like significantly more of like a drama yeah. than it is a superhero movie and even that has a hard time making it taken seriously whereas like the mcu movies for whatever reason the general population is just like these are all must see for we've us. all drank the kool-aid we're all in anytime a marvel anything happens Everyone's in. They're, I mean, they're they're literally the equivalent of Pixar. They're when a new one comes out, everybody and their kid goes to see them. The number of like, yeah, you, some of you guys know this that I run a toy company with my friend Alex Kessler. Um, he, it's his company, and I, I have a position there. But I travel a lot for that job, and I end up sitting on a lot of airplanes. And the number of like forty-seven-year-old dudes that I sit next to, who the conversation eventually moves to movies because I love them so much, and they tell me that they have a son who their favorite thing to do together is go see an MCU movie when it comes out. Right. We get into a conversation about superheroes because it just goes there, and they just tell me like that's the thing. Their kid loves them so much, and a new one comes out, and it's like a family event. This has happened to me like six or seven times. Right. Strangers flying around the country, and like. It's just that's that is crazy. So I I would take those movies because I think it's harder to replace those going forward than it is to replace good animated. Yeah, and, and what's interesting too is is that like what's funny is you tweeted about Marvel versus Pixar and I tweeted about the most iconic Pixar character ever and we both got about 50 responses within less than like 30 minutes to an hour. People care about these two properties so much people are so opinionated on these two properties it just shows how much everyone cares and pays attention to the fact that everyone has an opinion on them because everyone watches them so we're going to share those responses in just a second and we are going to get to our rankings but i wanted to just give you guys a quick call to action here because it means a lot to us um the first thing we're going to do is you know please guys subscribe like comment on the collider podcast feed here on youtube it's a big thing it's growing that channel is a big deal and it means a lot to us um, you know, go ahead and subscribe and leave your comments there on the Movie Talk feed. That's who's hosting this show. The third one is that Drew and I have this thing, Action Industries. He mentioned just a second ago. He shouted out the Action Advisory Board. We are trying everything in our power right now to build this thing. And the first call to action is go follow Team Action Show on Twitter and go follow Action Industries on Instagram. We just launched the Instagram last week, Action Industries. We're trying to be active, share the post. It, it promotes Action Movie Anatomy, our other show. It promotes this show. It promotes stuff of us in the Schmodown. It is absolutely the thing that we need from you guys to help us grow, to keep doing bigger and better things, to get bigger guests, budgets, to go fly places, to go to crazy premieres. 
That's what we want to do. We are truly trying to take the action brand worldwide. We need your guys' help to do it. So please follow Action Industries everywhere you can. There's a Facebook page. There's a Facebook group. Yeah. Just tweet at us. We'll let you know everywhere to go. Yeah, go find <clears throat> Action Industries on Action Industries on Facebook and give that page a like. It is in its early stages of development, but my goodness, is it going to be exciting stuff moving forward. Next up on the show, we're going to be ranking the most iconic Pixar characters of all time. And we've kind of thrown together this list of who we think people would probably be talking about. And we've got James Sullivan, Mike Wazowski, Mr. Incredible, Lightning McQueen, Dory, Nemo, Buzz, Woody, and a late addition due to my tweet was The Lamp. Now, this is a weird one because I don't think The Lamp is a real character. It's nah. a real character in the sense that it shows up in the animation at the beginning. And that's about it. And it's like... It's branding. And it is iconic, but it's like... I, I wouldn't take that over Woody or Buzz. Like, no. I, like for me, to be honest with you, when I look at this list, it's a pretty open-shut discussion. It's one of those two. I and, I and what's so crazy is I don't think – I think it's just Woody and Buzz. But but if you had to pick one – It's Woody. It's Woody because he's the original. He's the OG. I mean, the only other ones – I look on this list and I think to myself, okay, there was a minute, there was a minute around like 10 years ago, like a couple years into the Cars franchise – where I might have said Lightning McQueen. Okay. I might have said it at one point because I felt like Pixar had rebranded themselves so heavily. They had put the Cars ride in at Disneyland. Cars as a franchise. They had taken those like, you remember back like, I think it was even like pre-Cars or maybe it was during those old animations for Chevron, like the little like, like the Chevron commercials and the ads and things like you'd see like the Cars, like little Volkswagen bugs with the eyes. Oh, yeah. I think it was even before the brand existed. They took this really familiar thing that was out there, this artwork, and they made it into a freaking movie. It felt so iconic. And Lightning McQueen, just his look was like, that's the new yeah. That's the new Woody. And so if the Cars movies had been good. Like, and if they didn't make Toy Story 3? <laughs> yeah. And maybe, announce 4? Maybe like if they had stayed, you know, higher quality than Cars 1 going forward, it would have worked. But like, feels like that faded off. Monsters U was well-received, not beautifully received. Finding Dory was well-received, not beautifully received. The only Pixar franchise that's really managed to maintain at the highest level as like an event franchise it's Toy Story. is Toy Story. It's the only one. And and I'd say 80% plus are saying Buzz and Woody. Uh, Stephanie here is saying it's Buzz Lightyear. Woody's the heart, but Buzz is the icon. She's one of the few people that actually is having... Oh, and actually right below her, DF Bostrong says Buzz hands down, but... It does seem Woody and Buzz are the overwhelming uh, favorites, and I got to agree, especially after watching Toy Story three again this last weekend. It's just you grew up with them, yep. you, you know, and like I think it's so incredible to speak on like Tim Allen's career and how it just hasn't existed after Home Improvement. Yeah, <laughs> I mean Wild Dogs, but like he's still Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, and like still. when I go and I watch Toy Stories, I'm like, holy shit, that's still Tim Allen, still making millions and millions of dollars off of this. You can't have Toy Story without Buzz, and you can't have Buzz without his voice. And it's just crazy to think about, like, I can guarantee you Tim Allen, everyone involved in this, because you go back and you look, almost everyone is still there that's done the voice. Obviously, Jim Varney is not. Rest in peace. And Arlie Emery as well. <clears throat> as now and gone. Arlie Emery. And what about uh, Don Rickles is still, is he still alive? I'm not totally sure. Just potato head. Uh, but anyway, the idea behind it, though, is just that, like, we're looking now. It's what twenty five years, twenty four years I mean, later. Pixar night, yeah. Pixar, yeah. Pixar uh, sorry, Toy Story four is going to be the twenty fifth <laughs> anniversary of Pixar, and it's like we're still doing these voices that are still that impactful. And I go back and I watch, I watch Toy three, Toy Story three as a thirty year old man, and I still cry. So, yeah, uh, yeah Buzz and Woody. I, I think I agree. I think I have to go Woody myself. Do you? Do you? I think I go Woody. I yeah. think he's the number one. And you know, on my side of thing, this this tweet about Marvel versus Pixar, it's pretty split down the middle, but it does seem like it's leaning towards Pixar. I would say it seems like at least 60% is, in is keeping it. Keeping Pixar. Got it. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> but it's it's interesting. There's a lot of interaction here. There's like 50 or so responses. You can go check our Twitters out to see what these, uh, these are like. And the Action Industries Twitter, uh, I think, is featuring both of these as well and has its own thoughts. So yeah, it does. Let's uh, continue through and get into the next bit of the show. And this is the definitive ranking of every single Pixar movie starting back to front. Uh, we're going to start with the clunkers. Yeah, the, the real, real bad ones. And... Uh, I've seen Cars 2, so I'm going to go ahead and say it's the worst Pixar movie of all time. It, it's uh, It was interesting watching all these movies, I have to tell you. you know, it's I, There's movies on this list that I would never have watched had it not been for 
I want to make sure that I'm watching every Pixar movie for Schmodown. Right. And Cars 2 is one of the ones... I watched all the three Cars movies in a row at one point. I have a soft spot for the Cars movies because of Paul Newman. He's my favorite actor of <laughs> all time. I don't know if you know this about him. <laughs> uh, and he plays a great character, and it's just fun that he's like, he gets to have the kind of sage-like voice, and he's got the yeah. great Paul Newman voice. I love Paul Newman, but um, he's not even really a part of Cars 2, and, I mean, obviously he had passed on at that point. They managed right. to use him in Cars 3 with, like, old footage, but... Uh, <laughs> old found <Yeah>. animated footage. <laughs> I think they did maybe old takes from the first movie. They, that's how they use them. Yeah. But Cars 2 is pretty bad. They introduce a bunch of new characters. Michael Caine gets introduced. Um, oh, yeah. He's like a secret agent. And and then uh, Holly Shiftwell, I think, be, is, is played by... Uh, is the, that Ellen? Oh, no, that's in the first one. No, it's the yeah. girl from uh, Newsroom whose name... I, uh, oh, Emily Mortimer. Yeah, yeah, She's yeah. in there. And, 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 like, it's just bad. There's a lot of Mater. There's a lot of Larry the Cable oh, Guy. Oh, God, because that was when he was, like, on top of the world. World. Yeah, and he's a lovable character, but they just went way too heavy. Um, usually when I tell people, Mater. like, Cars, Mater, Mater they're Mater. like, just too much Mater. Yeah. Uh, number 19 is The Good Dinosaur. Most people would have that as 20. Yeah, most people would. It's the forgotten Pixar movie. And it's because it's because Cars 1 was so good that Cars 2 being that bad, and the fact that Cars 3 is better than Cars 2, and that they had something so great to work off with all these great characters, that's why we feel like it should be below The Good Dinosaur. Whereas The Good Dinosaur was another, like, original idea that just didn't really work. You've it's just, seen it. Yeah, The Good Dinosaur feels a lot like those bad Disney movies from like 99 to 08. Like Disney's Dark Age after their... So like just before we get to the the, the just missed territory after these clunkers, uh -huh. a, a little bit of the history here for people to forget is that Disney was a powerhouse, right, for, for 50, 60 years, right? All the stuff going back to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves all through the 70s, the 80s. They had good movies and bad movies, but the real heart of our childhood... Was that run right? It's like right. The the like Oliver and Company's okay. That's eighty eight. But then it's like eighty nine. You get Little Mermaid. Ninety one. You get Beauty and the Beast. Ninety two is Aladdin. Ninety four is The Lion King. That's just a crazy run. Yeah. Then Pocahontas in ninety five is okay. People like it. I liked it. Ninety six is Hunchback. It's pretty bad, but it's okay. Mulan's ninety seven. So that's like step up again. Yeah. Ninety eight is Hercules, which is again just okay. That's, no, that was pretty popular when it came out. But still, it's like the it's like <clears throat> the tail end. And then they skip a year, I believe, in 2000 is Emperor's New Groove, which just kind of spells like the difference in style. Yeah, it feels like a different it, – it's like a – yeah, it's, it's just a change. It's, it's a change of the guard. It's a funny movie. I like Emperor's yeah. New Groove. It's but just it's, not – it didn't feel like classic Disney. It's no Lion King. And then literally from there to basically all the way through, I'd say, like Tangled Wreck-It Ralph, they make like Brother Bear. They make like uh, – Atlantis, The Lost Empire, they make Treasure Planet, they this make is Disney. This is all Disney. Yeah. They make The Princess and the Frog. They make like a lot of movies that are just not very good. They're fine. During Pixar's like real heart of their run, you know, Monsters Inc. and Nemo and Incredibles, like this is what Disney's making. It was a really bad time for you to start shooting poorly. Essentially, yeah. you know. They just I mean they just didn't adapt. They didn't yeah. start making 3D movies until a little later. And like Disney's been great since about 2011, but really since you know, that whole entire decade was Pretty rough. Because now Moana feels like a Pixar movie. Yeah. Like it just does. Yeah. It feels I mean, exactly like it. Now you've got Zootopia, you have Moana, you have Frozen, you yep. have Wreck-It Ralph 1 and 2, you have Frozen 2 coming out. Like Disney's back back at it's, it. It's right there. But it's funny because they're still the same company, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> this, this is so interesting. So this is the just miss. These are the movies that were like pretty enjoyable, but... When you go back and you're like, I want to watch a Pixar movie, it's probably not one of these unless for some reason they really hold close to your heart. And number 18 is A Bug's Life. I haven't watched this movie in probably 15 years. I watched like 10, I re I rewatched years. it. And and it was fine, you said? It's okay. Like when I rewatched yeah. it, it's like it's none of the main characters are super likable. They're stuck in like – old not great disney territory there's something about disney and pixar movies now where there's like this really nice polished quality about them where you feel like you feel like clean and pristine and like you're watching bugs life feels like a different company yeah you know what i mean it doesn't have like it just doesn't have the thing the originality that toy story had like it feels like bugs life is ants to pixar's different movie yeah like pixar had a better bug movie it's you like know? just an okay movie like the the circus troupe is pretty good dennis leary is good a lot of the a lot of the uh the, the character voices in that movie are pretty good like yeah kevin spacey's in it as a grasshopper yeah. um but yeah it's just un, it's not it's un, it's unspectacular it's next okay. up we've got finding dory which this is a weird one to be so low. Yeah, I mean, it was like, it came out, you saw those posters, right? It was like, Incredibles 2, Finding Dory, Cars 3, all these big announcements, and 
<clears throat> I just remember when I watched Finding Dory, I was like, this is the same thing as the first one, but just not as good or interesting or fun or anything. Just tons of big actors, yeah. just like some pretty funny stuff, but just didn't have the charm that Nemo had. And I'm actually lower on Nemo than a lot of people. I think Nemo's a really good movie. But, yeah, I like Nemo a lot. Um, I didn't watch Nemo when it came out. I watched Nemo like the, for the first time like five or six years after. It's a very like child friendly movie. It's... I almost feel like we might have Nemo a little too high on the list, but I think it's because we're speaking for the audience as well. You ask like some people like like movie enthusiasts who love Disney, like Alex Kessler. Yes, right. Kim. I think Nemo's his, his favorite. His we, number... asked, we asked Roxy Stradiday, who's the most iconic character in Pixar films. She said Dory. She said Nemo. I oh, think. yeah, she said Nemo. I mean, yeah, right. people people love Finding Nemo on a crazy level. So, like, I, yeah, we'll get to it when we get to yeah, it. But yeah. Dory just didn't do anything <clears throat> new. They just were like, Ellen is Ellen, so let's right. just give her a movie and it'll make a shitload of money. Whereas, like, 15 years passed between Incredibles and Incredibles 2, and it felt like watching Incredibles 1 again. Like, it really did. They breathed new life, and they just did something different and special, yeah. and yeah. it was great. Yeah, so uh, next on the list, we've got Monsters University at 16. Totally fun. Totally, I, I love this movie. I love this movie. I actually went to this movie with low expectations. Weird, because it's a Pixar film, and it's with characters I love, but it's super fun. It's a great time. They, don't they kind of like play on the whole Bella's thing with uh, with Pitch Perfect and stuff? They totally do. You yeah. know, I'm actually going to executive decision here, just because I think this is wrong. Sure. I'm going to swap it with the 15 because I think we both like it, and I'm realizing now this is a mistake. Do you think it should be 14, too? I think it should be 15, and I think Brave, which is next on the list, should actually be in the spot. So let's just talk about both. I'm going to say Brave is 16 and Monsters U is 15. Perfect. You can talk about both of them because I said what I need to say about Monsters U, and I haven't seen Brave. Brave's just fine. It's it's a movie that is the only Pixar movie with a Disney princess. It's, Hmm. uh, It's like a... (laughs) <laughs> and they like make fun of her in Wreck It Ralph too, don't they? Yeah, it's really it's sweet. It's like really funny. <laughs> Brave is like good enough. It's again, it's got a big cast and it's got a different flavor than a lot of the other Pixar movies. But Monsters University has better characters and Monsters University has like some pretty good jokes. And Mike Wazowski and is it Patrick Sullivan? Is that his name? Patrick uh, Sullivan? John. John uh, James. Oh yeah, James Sullivan. James, yeah, 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 James Sullivan. They're just better characters. Like Monsters University has that like old school vibe a little bit. Like it's like the the frat house of their yeah, guys. Yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah. The movie's pretty entertaining. Um, so I think, and then Brave is just like Brave is probably the weirdest Pixar movie because it's the one that it came out a year apart from Frozen, and I think there's just this like a year before. Yeah, it was a year before Frozen, right? right. And I think it just like it was the odd Disney princess attempt by Pixar. And then Disney just made a Disney princess movie that became the defining Which movie Frozen. of its decade for right. Disney. It did, Frozen is as big as The Lion King was. Frozen's like, uh, it's Easily. like, it's like as big a movie as Disney's had. People still dress up as Elsa yeah. for Halloween. It's, it's as big as their long time. is. So I think uh, Brave just gets kind of forgotten in that way. Yeah, so uh, we'll do Brave at 16, Monsters U at 15, and then Cars 3 This rounds out our just missed category. Now, this is close. This is a close movie. It almost makes it on to the actually, like, legit movies category because Cars 3 is pretty good. Yeah, but then when you go through and you look at the other 13 movies ahead of it, It's impossible to place it in front of any one of them. Like, pound for pound, it doesn't beat any of these movies. I don't remember Cars 3 that well. I actually think I have seen it. It's uh, it's interesting. They, so they, they 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 do some old found footage. I think it's old voice takes of Newman, right. and that helps it. It's yeah, nice yeah, to yeah. see, and that's probably why I like it as much as I do. <laughs> it's like only <laughs> up that high because of Newman. Chris Cooper's got a role in it. He I shows up. He's great. Is he a nice. bad guy? No, he's like he's. I think he was. I think he was Doc Hudson's coach. Maybe I must have not seen this. He. I think he's like he was the guy that trained Newman's character. Maybe interesting. And the cool thing about Cars Three, what's fun about it is, and I, I can spoil this, right? I think we can spoil anything. Yeah, Cars Three. What's cool about it is that um, when did Cars Three come out last year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, twenty two years ago, twenty seventeen. Might yeah, have been eighteen. 18 anymore. I think it was twenty seventeen. I'll look it up. Um, the cool thing about Cars Three is that Lightning McQueen in the first movie is like this young hotshot, right? And he wants to he wants to win the Piston Cup. But Cars Three, he's getting old and he wants to win the Piston Cup. And you have Army Hammer come in as this like real young like oh. badass racer, and you're 17. like, oh. And you're like, okay, so so McQueen's going to have to learn how to be faster to keep up. And in the end of the movie, he finally like realizes that it's not about him. It's about letting go, and he has to like basically train someone else. And so then his trainer, who's like a woman, and it's like her name is uh, uh, Cruz Ramirez, I believe. Yep. Uh, you know, she's like a Hispanic woman character. He like gets behind 
being like, wow, you actually are fast. I can train you to be better than this this jackass. Oh, that's cool. And so he like trains her and he like elevates her. And so it's a good message there. 6.8 IMDb 2017. It's not a great movie. It's a good movie. It ends well. I like the way that it ends the trilogy. And I walked away from it feeling like it was... It's just that it's up against tough competition because Pixar's such high quality. So that's that's the second category. That's the just missed category. Yeah, and now we're going to get into the honorable mentions. These are the final three before we get into the top ten. And honestly, putting these movies on here is, is, is still really tough. And we're not going to leave where we just were. Cars number one, the original installment, it comes in at 13. And I think the reason we have it so low is that – or not even so low, but it's just – it's just not as good as everything above it. It's still a great movie. It's fun. Ellen's great. Her and Owen Wilson, you know, Newman's excellent in it. You get the cable no, guy. Ellen's in uh, in Nemo. You're thinking of um, or uh, uh, Bonnie Hunt. Yeah, Bonnie. Yeah, Hunt. Yeah, Bonnie Hunt. Excuse yeah. me. Uh, in in Cars, she's she's amazing and like, yeah, it's a fun movie. It's totally fun, and and I think this is. I mean, I, I keep referencing him, but I think this movie is elevated so much by the gravitas <laughs> yes. of Paul Newman. I think, of course. I think without Newman, this movie really does feel like a very much a retread. Well, it's, his voice is so important too. If you think about everyone's voices in there, you think of like Larry the Cable Guy, Owen Wilson, and and Bonnie Hunt. His voice is necessary in there the same way like Morgan Freeman's is necessary in Shawshank. You need this calming, soothing, kind of like comforting voice. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it just it makes the movie work. It's the only thing that makes the movie work. And I honestly think Cars could be lower, but it's just it's good enough. And it's too iconic. Um, yeah, it became. I mean, it's more visually iconic than anything else. Yeah. Um, next up on our honorable mentions list is The Incredibles Two at number twelve. So good. This movie was great. I just watched it again yesterday on Netflix or two days ago. I, like I saw this. I really liked it. I think the action's terrific. I liked. All the characters. I love the casting of Catherine Keener and Bob Odenkirk. I love like the screen slaver and kind of like evolving with the times. Like this movie just worked. It was just very, very good all the way across the board. Um, it took 15 years to make it, and I was happy waiting that long. Yeah. And, it, and like I said earlier in the show, it felt like coming back and watching Incredibles again. Like Jack Jack was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's on the honorable mentions list because I don't have any inkling to rewatch it. I like, Think about it. I'm like, um, yeah, it's it's really good. I didn't either. But then I came home one day and my roommate was watching it, and I watched for ten minutes. And I was like, oh, God, this movie's fun, and yeah. that's why I turned it on. And now, now in my mind, <clears throat> it's higher than it was, you know, before this last weekend. Uh, and what do we have at number eleven, Ben? Number eleven, we got Monsters Inc. So this is probably an unpopular miss in the top ten. I yeah. think there's a lot of people that would have this movie higher. Um, Monsters Inc. Like. Sort of the Mike Wazowski. That like this is like the little engine that could in terms of the early Pixar picks. It's mm -hmm. like the fan favorite nostalgia movie. This is very much Mulan for people in terms of Pixar. It's so funny and fun and like and like well done and Boo is so adorable. Yeah, when I say Mulan, it's like that movie that everyone's like, oh, psh, Monsters Inc. Of course, right, right. Not like oh, Monsters Inc. That's in the top three. No one says that about Mulan. People are no. always like. Oh, it's worse than Lion King, but Mulan, it's, it's great, great it's movie. People yes. don't say that about Hercules. People say that about Mulan. Like, and it's about probably of almost equal quality. So yeah, Monsters, Inc. is just that fan favorite. I don't know why. Yeah, there's something about it. Like, even though it's so great and it's a great happy ending and the, the whole franchise is excellent, there's just something about it that doesn't have that it factor that this top ten has. And so... I mean, I, I think the, the relationship between Goodman's character and Boo, like, I think that's oh, really amazing. special. Like, yeah. he's really loved. I mean, they, this, they're great. And the, the chemistry between Crystal and Goodman, like, really fun. <laughs> yeah, I love I love Billy Crystal. Yeah. Number 10, finally getting into the top 10. And this is probably a lot lower than most people would put it, honestly. Toy Story 2. It, I mean, it's a great movie. It's 100% of Rotten how Tomatoes. Is this, how is this movie number 10, you ask? And I think... I think we connect more with some of the movies higher on this list. I think there's obviously two more Toy Story movies in this top ten, so one of them was going to have to be the lowest. Right, and and there's something about the original, and there's something about what the third one does, especially as a 30-year-old now going back and watching it. I watched it again this last weekend, and saying goodbye to your youth, getting older, saying goodbye to your mom, moving out for college, saying goodbye to your toys. There's just something about it and moving on in life. What's the name of the song? Is it When She Loved Me? Is that what it is? I'm not sure. It's the one where Emily, uh, that's <clears throat> that's um, uh, Jesse's Jesse's old owner, right. like drops her right. off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's When She Loved Me, maybe. And it's such a sad moment. It's such a pretty moment. Um, 
like you know you have uh, you have Wayne Knight who plays uh, Al Al from Al's Toy yeah, Barn. Yeah. You have all the Zerg stuff, the fun Star Wars references. Yeah, I mean Woody. Like this movie is just great. Like it's it's a really good movie. When I rewatched all these, it doesn't stand out in the way that it's important, like the first or the third. And it's not right. as like it's not as uh, I don't know, it doesn't push in the way that some of these other Toy Story or these other Pixar movies do. Yeah, it doesn't hit you in the same places, whereas, like, this next movie, <clears throat> Wally at number nine, that was that first, like, real deep dive into the socio- sociological look of what's happening to our society and our weight and our dependency on fast food and things it, being easy. The weird thing about Wally is that when I saw Wally, I didn't see it in theaters. I probably saw Wally in 2009 or 10 the first time. A couple years later, and when I watched Wally the first time, yeah, I was like, "Wally's amazing." It's like a silent movie for the first forty-five minutes. Like, how is this a Pixar movie? You're right. Um, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm coughing. okay. I'm just like, I don't know. I'm like choking over here. Um, and I loved it, and I remember thinking it was so good, and you'd see it high on lists, and people just really praised it. When I rewatched Wally last year, it was like, this is kind of boring. It's like really good, and it's really smart. But even after. Even after they make it up to the big like spaceship and like people are talking, right? It's just not that good. It's like the the story once it takes that turn is not that compelling. The first forty five minutes is a fascinating attempt, and it's a great movie. And it's definitely top ten. But I, there was a time when I think I would have thought Wally was like top three, and it just <laughs> doesn't do it for me in that same way. Why do we have it over Toy Story two? Because it's smarter than Toy right. Story two. Yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. because the first forty five minutes is what it is, and it's. Yeah. And it is a really special. It is a really like special thing. Like that's crazy that an animated movie for children would allow that to happen. It's it's the, also the first piece of that second era of Pixar, where like the movie before this was Cars, mm-hmm. and then they're like, we're gonna just make this movie, and there's not gonna be any talking for 45 minutes. <clears throat> I don't know what is going on with me over here. Well, you're just you guys are gonna have to just deal with Andrew coughing a lot. <clears throat> I just like can't breathe or, or talk or cough or, or do anything but cough. So number eight here is Coco. And this is interesting because we had it higher earlier on, and this movie was adored by fans. Like, it, did it win best song? Yes, remember me. Yeah, it won best song at the Oscars. Like, this is huge. Yeah. Massive. But I also think it's a little bit of that. I just saw this movie. It makes me feel really good. I think it has to do with like the first time ever we're having like, what, what, you know, like a Latino animated character lead a Pixar film. It's it's massive. And yeah, I, I mean, I think I think there was stuff about Coco that was like, I think the the city design, all the bright lights. I think like the Day of the Dead stuff yeah, that was amazing, incredible. I think the music was great. I think I think it connected to a lot of people. The tradition, in the same way that like when I watched My Big Fat Greek Wedding, I was like, this movie sucked. Right. It's like this movie legit sucked. And I tweeted that and a bunch of people were like, I grew up in a very strict Greek household. I grew up in an Indian household. I grew up in an Italian household. I with a very strict mother and I yeah. related to this movie so much. So and like when I watch Crazy Rich Asians, like I I know Michelle Yao. Yeah. I know that woman, that mother. And so I think there's a part of Coco and the family being like so religious and so just like you can't do this that a lot of people watched, both both Hispanic and other cultures. Of course. That it really connected. I think that the combination of all of that with the fact that we're in this like sort of progressive culture now where uh, elevating elevating different cultures, different races in mainstream media is so important. It was a big step forward for a company like Disney to or Pixar to invest in this. And I think that's why people liked it as much as they did is on top of being a good movie. Yeah, a wonderful movie and the music's amazing and it, it, you know the colors are brilliant. I, I'm very curious to see how this movie was talked about in a place like not like SoCal, where we're right next to the border, where there is such a massive population that it, this does endear to so much. I wonder what it's like in the middle of the country if people think it just like came and went or not. It's like an interesting thing to think about. Like it might have the say, the it might have the Wally effect in ten years. Right, exactly. Where, where it was like it was interesting for that reason, but like as you get further away from it, it's going to matter less. Um, next on the list, I think, is a movie actually that is kind of the opposite of that. Yeah, which is it's Ratatouille. People just love and love this movie more and more as time goes on. I watched Ratatouille for the first time last year. So it was one of the few that yeah. I had missed entirely. One of the few good ones that I had entirely missed. And when I watched Ratatouille, I was struck by a couple things. The first one is that this movie manages to get by on basically no gimmick. Yeah. There's no there's no like thing. It's not talking cars that have like that tie I mean, into talking toys. Mouse, kind of. Yeah, but like the okay, like the talking cars and cars tie into Disneyland rides and they tie right, into like right, collectible right, right. toys. And like you look at, you know, Nemo, you've got 
I, I guess I guess there's reasons to compare any of them. Yeah. But Ratatouille is just simple. Like Remy, Remy the rat is literally. Wait, is it Remy? Yes, yeah, Remy. He's like controlling him, like a with his hair. Yeah. And the relationship between the woman who works at the restaurant with the guy, and like their romance, and then and his father, and the way that like they're he's taking advantage of, and he's such a sweet character. I just, I don't know. And and then like the, the character of the food critic. Yeah, who he who finally has his moment where he makes the ratatouille and it takes him back to being a ch- his mother's cooking and he gives his incredible it like that movie just made me so happy. Yeah, and it just it just feels good and it's like the basic story is so simple. Yeah, it's just like if you wanted something, if you have a dream to do something, just do it. It's your passion. Do your passion, and like it's just executed so well. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the reason it's so good is that if you love it, do it. And it's the same message with Coco, but. Coco ties into all these other things that make it really elevated. Ratatouille really didn't. And, like, again, they, they make Ratatouille, oh, it's actually the first one in 07, and then Wally's 08. Right. But, like, that's the that's where they start. They go Ratatouille, then they go Wally, and they go on this insane run of, like, we're just going to trust that people know our brand enough to watch these movies. And it's like the simplicity between, behind Ratatouille is one of the things that elevates it so much. It is such a simple beautiful story 12 years later it's just as good as people talked about it when it first came out yeah and it seems like it it's it's aged really well and last one outside of the top five is the incredibles the first one now here's what's fascinating about the incredibles one and this is this is what i was thinking about just now you can't make ratatouille really with real people you could try but a talking rat that's controlling someone's hair is a weird Disney movie. It's a kid's movie. Like, you have to animate the rat. Like, I don't like that movie. I don't want to see that movie. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't either. You make Incredibles, you make it a little darker with real actors, it's a great movie. Yeah. I I could watch that movie. That's a real drama. Like, Yeah, I'd watch a a live-action Incredibles. Totally. That'd be sweet. And, like, the, The Incredibles just works so well. Like, the first 15 minutes of The Incredibles is just, like, I'm so in. This yeah. is so compelling. Like these retired superheroes and the old news clips and Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl and how they meet. And they, yeah. Like, and then he's got his job he hates and they're living. Like, I just loved all of it. When I watched it again, I was like, man, this this movie gets it. This it, movie totally gets they it. They totally get it. They totally epitomize like what it is to be. I mean, just like what we all think as kids, you're like, well, now that we're all growing up, it's like, what is it like if a superhero grows up, you know? And like, yeah. what is it like when the world changes? There's so much of that happening in all the other movies too. Like even in Logan, it's like, there's no room for superheroes anymore in this world. And it's it's interesting to see the Incredibles do that that long ago yeah, as and successfully I, as they did. And I think like, I, I love, I love the idea that, um, you know, as these superheroes grow up in this world, like... I just lost my train of thought. Shit. Yeah, that's all right. You can come back to it. Um, (coughs) If you remember in time, (laughs) moving into the very top five, Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo, number five. I mean, this is a movie for a lot of people. This This is the number one Pixar movie for a lot of people. Yeah, it's just... It's so iconic. It's so funny. There's so many great characters in it. You got the the, you know, you've got everyone in the fish tank. You've got all the tortoise sigh, the tortai, and you know, riding the wave. You've got the sharks, like. It's just so great and fun, and in in Albert Brooks and Ellen DeGeneres' chemistry is wonderful. Yeah, it's memorable in the way it's memorable in a lot of the same ways that the adventure of a movie like The Lion King was memorable. It feels a lot. Yeah, feels a lot like that. Like it's just all the there's parts of it that if you watch as an adult for the first time, you're like, this is a kids movie. And there's also parts of it that you might watch and just be like, this is just such simple basic storytelling at its best. Like all these characters are, are lovable. I mean, the, the the sharks who are like in the AA meeting trying to not eat yeah, fish. Yeah. Like, that's all really funny and then like the fact that I mean Willem Dafoe and the and the fish tank um, I think you hit on a really crucial point though when you said you're watching it and you still like this is a kids movie yeah because like you still have moments of that where you're like oh this is fun for kids you know like da 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 whereas like I think when we get into the top four here that's really what separates them is they're all still kids movies but you don't really have that moment no. Where you're like, this is a movie made for children, and I'm getting a kick out of this because I'm an adult. I'm lucky. You and know? what's interesting about this is the top four. There's a movie at least from each of these in every one of our golden age, our, our golden ages that we separated. Yeah, I know. I was looking at that earlier, which I thought was cool. And so picking the golden age is going to be really interesting. Um, number four is Toy Story three. Now this is this is a blasphemous <sighs> pick for some people because yeah. this is generally regarded by most people as the best Pixar movie. And it's because the people that are put in place to make those opinions are around 30 to 50 now. Yeah. And this movie speaks to 30 to 50-year-olds like none other. Yeah, and it's it's a, 
it's fascinating. It's like they're every every time Andy gets a little older, the story changes a little, and yeah. these toys get older. And and you know, Lotso Bear played by was it Ned Beatty who plays yeah, him? Yeah, and he does in in like you know he was one. He, Lotso came up once as the most iconic Pixar character because he is he is the Kylo Ren of this world, the tortured person who who you understand why they are the villain that they are yeah right you right know? right the story you've heard about you know the story you've seen with woody getting you know ripped and thrown yeah and you've seen it happen to jesse and you've seen it you're like, like you've seen it happen to all these characters now it finally you realize it happened to him and, and that's it happened what it is. bad you yeah know? And, and i think that like so many of the supporting characters they introduce in this one you know ken being played by michael keaton is really <laughs> he's so fun. good yeah he's great like you know ken and barbie their whole romance is do you know who's the octopus uh, the octopus in this one? Yeah. Octopus in Toy Story 3. I'll have to give you a hint. It's a woman. I, like, don't even remember the, the octopus character is. She's, like, one of the, one of the like, lotso villains. It's Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, interesting. Was, I remember, like, watching it and being like, that voice. What is that voice? And I thought you were going to say the octopus in Finding Dory, the one with only seven oh, tentacles. Oh, right. Is played by, uh, what the, his, the hell's his name from Modern Family, Married with Children. Oh, uh, Ty Burrell? No, the, uh... I'm just blanking on his name. Uh, Al from Al Bundy from Married with Children. Oh, oh, uh, Dad. Uh, why can't I think of his name? Ed O'Neill. Ed O'Neill. Ed yes. O'Neill. Yeah, he plays the octopus in that movie. So I thought you were talking. You were going there, but yeah, <laughs> Toy Story three, great movie. When I watched it again, my thought was a couple things. First of all, in, in when the Oscars expanded past five movies, there was back to back films nominated for Best Picture from Pixar in 09 and 010. 2009 was up, and 2010 was Toy Story three, mm-hmm. and both of those movies get a little bit of a push. In the cultural zeitgeist, based on that, yeah, um, absolutely, that's Toy huge. S- Toy Story three makes sense. You're attached to these characters, so all these years later, fifteen years later, you watch this movie, and it feels like you've watched these characters grow up just the same way you've grown up. Yep. And I think that's why a lot of people connect to it the way they do. I think it's great. It doesn't affect me quite as much as the top three. Yeah, it doesn't affect me quite as much as the top three, and you know, it wouldn't be where it is without. The original Toy Story, you know, and so uh, moving on to number three. Yeah, number three, and this is the top three is insane. Yeah. I almost feel like this is the best Pixar movie, but I know I'm putting, I actually think this might be my favorite. Yeah, I'm gonna put number three is Inside Out. Bing bong, bing bong, bing bong. God, that's heartbreaking when I mean, he's left down when there. When he's left behind. Yes, Inside Out is the most head trip, amazing, incredible concept Pixar movie ever made. It's so brilliant, so sad, so beautiful. Like, it's so brilliant. Like, the idea of these islands that we devote our energy to and care about and those islands changing is so real. And the dream, just like, it, it was like when I watched Inception and, and they, 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 like, say things and I'd be like, oh, my God, that's so true. I've never dreamed, <laughs> I've never died in a dream and I've never, like, I never remember how I got somewhere in a dream, like, crazy. It was this insane. insane. Yeah. <laughs> that was, like, inside out for me. Like, they would keep doing things in there and speaking about emotional... They should make Inception <laughs> too. I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> the emotional intelligence of that movie and, like, actually being able to quantify emotional intelligence was amazing and like make it into a physical object i mean amazing it had so many moments i mean bing bong watching the different memories crumble and like and like in the way that she's like joy is looking at sadness and she's like don't touch anything and she can't help herself right and as she's becoming a teenager like her emotions are changing and things are changing the things that were important are gone and like i mean that movie is is honestly the most brilliant heartbreaking pixar movie it's just it's h- almost hard to even imagine as a kid you could possibly watch that movie and not miss things oh you i feel like as a kid you miss 90 percent of that movie and you just enjoy kind of all the fun stuff and like you can't have ha- happiness with, you can't have joy without sadness you yeah. can't have all these th- it's just yeah it's so genius and i remember watching it and like i, I crying and like yeah and just being blown away and kind of like awestruck at the end of it. It was just one of those things that it was a really, really incredibly special film. And I I can't imagine there'll be another movie like that in a very long time. Yeah, it's it's a concept movie that just it worked. I mean, it, it worked on every and, level. And, and, and then again, you go to the voice acting, which is one of the things Pixar is the best at is their casting. Yeah. Everyone is perfectly cast in this All movie. Of them, yeah. yeah. Number two, the original gangster, Toy Story One. Yeah. The where it all started. Yeah, Toy Story One on rewatch feels simple compared to something like an Inside Out. Yeah, it's a totally different animal. It's really good. 
but you remember when you're watching it, this is the first time you're meeting Woody. Yeah. This is the first time you're meeting Buzz. They don't like each other. You've got a friend in me, like yep. Andy, like Sid, all the, I mean, out, like a, a, a pizza planet. Yeah, like, man. Just the stuff in this movie is... Like, wow. I remember everything about this movie. It just stuck with you so much. The animation was fresh yeah. and brand new. And and, and there like were so many toys and games and the whole world stopped when Toy Story came out and everyone took a piece of the pie and was like, everything needs to have a bit of that in it. Whether it's McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, oh Walmart, Target, like every company had to have something with Toy Story. It was like the so brilliant. It was so relatable. You're like, oh, Mr. Potato Head's a character? Yeah. You're like, you're like, oh, that green dinosaur toy that we all have, like Rex? That was, that's a character? That was the other thing is we we all grew up with those toys. We all played with every the single slinky? one of those toys except for Buzz and Woody. Yeah. You know? The army men? Yes. All of them. It was just like, whoa. Oh, the army men were so good. And then also going back and watching Toy Story 3 and, and remembering that it all spawned in Toy Story 1 was like watching them pull off heists as toys or like even just like when they run and how silly they look like it's just amazing like, and like yeah and the way that like Woody's the leader and he's got yeah, I mean he gets his horse in the second movie but like yeah. just Toy Story one is special for all the reasons that we almost are just like losing it talking about yeah. it yeah because it's just it's like movies like that just don't come along very often that that create something that created this world without the success of Toy Story one if it goes Toy Story one it's just okay and Bugs Life is the second movie and it's just what it is then. I don't know if Pixar ever happens. Right. They they might fire the wrong people. They might yeah. hire the wrong people. It was the common it was the fact that they started out so strong they could withstand one stumble to get into position to make another Toy Story and then to keep the train rolling. And what's interesting about the original Toy Story is that you go to someone who's five years old or someone who's eighty years old and they love it. And they love it for the same reasons. Whereas yeah. like we just talked about the inside out. A kid misses 90% of the reasons why you love Inside Out as an adult. Yeah. Whereas Toy Story is just like, like you said, it's so much more simple. It's on the nose. You totally yeah. get it. Number one. Yeah, and this is controversial. Now even just talking about it, actually, it, it makes me wonder if Inside Out's supposed to be here and this is supposed to be swapped with it exactly. Maybe, yeah. Could but be. our pick for number one is up. Yeah, and, and I think one of the reasons why, if not the main reason why, is Pixar shows you that they know how to touch your feels, to hit you in the feels in three minutes if they want to make you ball your eyes out. And they're like, they're just like, by the way, the movie hasn't even started yet. <laughs> You're gonna be crying. The whole the first 10 minutes of that movie, like, is the saddest thing I could think of that like it is so heartbreaking. You don't even know the characters. They don't no. have you don't have to be attached. There's no, no there's no big twist. They don't even freaking talk hardly. The earnest in their relationship is like she makes him young. She keeps him young. You always see it like they're laying there and she's pointing at the stars and he's just enamored by her. She's perfect. And <clears throat> they work at the same place. You even see him get older as like he's giving away balloons and then he learns like to lean on it. They touch on crazy things in there. She can't have kids yeah. in there. They touch on the fact that. <clears throat> they wanted to save up all this money to go to this place that she's been dreaming about since a kid, but things keep happening: breaking down cars, breaking bones. Oh, you're having me to cry just talking about it. It's, it. it's it's like stuff in you get older and in real life that you like experience. You time passes, memories happen. You realize things you wanted to do you never did. Like it's something that almost everyone in the world can relate to. You lose your parents, you lose your grandparents. I watched this with my ex girlfriend. You know, probably around the same time as Ratatouille. Like maybe 2010, yeah. right the year after it came out, and she was within a year of losing her grandmother, and I just remember she bawled her eyes out. We had to stop watching and, like, pick it back up an hour later because she, like, couldn't take it. It was too much. She, like, it's so simple. Like, she's just walking up the hill together, the same hill they've walked up for 20, 30, 40 years, and she just can't make it. Like, it's incredible. And that's not even talking about the movie and the things that they speak on in the actual film and, like, doing what you never accomplished in life and doing what you said you would do. And there's just so much about this movie that speaks to love and life and love lost and opportunities lost. It's just, <clears throat> and it happened before Inside Out. Yeah, you know? and, and totally. And he's got, I mean, Russell doesn't have a father really. And so you have, you know, uh, Ed Asner, whose character's name I can't even remember, Mr. Carl. Yeah, Carl. Like, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, he's, 
and he kind of almost like adopts him by the end of the movie and and you have you know Plummer is I mean probably the Christopher Plummer stuff at the end is maybe the weakest part of the movie right you like don't care that much about him being a villain but all the dogs are really funny yeah, like, yeah. they're great and like you have a uh, Kevin the big the big bird and he's great you have the first Pixar movie with an Asian like chubby boy is the lead yeah which was cool which is cool i mean the stuff at the beginning where he like freaks out and he hits the construction worker and you're like wow this is like really what it's like right well sometimes people get old and they get kind of paranoid and crazy and and yeah and he's embarrassed he's so embarrassed he goes inside the house and then when it takes off with the balloons in the same way that coco is so beautiful the balloons and the city it's so gorgeous the colors in that movie are are on the same level. It's like the same kind of thing. And then the suspension of belief where you're like, I'm okay with this house being carried by balloons. I'm just okay that the balloons carry the house and that's how this is going to work. that's what he's done his whole life. So he's got to know these balloons better than anyone. Yeah, it's... But, yeah, Up is just... It's perfect. Yep. It's a perfect movie. Yeah, I love Up. I mean, it's... You could make an argument for Inside Out in the same way, but Up doesn't have to try quite as hard to be heady to be the best yes, Pixar movie. Yes, It gets to be a little bit more of a traditional movie. Right, with the adventure in there, which which you do get in Inside Out as well, but it's just... It's a different type of adventure. Yeah, so... Yeah. That is our definitive ranking of every Pixar film. I wonder what you guys think. I wonder if you agree with our rankings or not. Please let us know in the comments below. If you're listening to this, go ahead and follow us on Twitter, Ben Bateman Media, at Andrew Guy. You can follow us at Team Action Show and let us know your thoughts there. There are a few other places you guys can find us. Um, cause I think we're kind of out of time here. Yeah, we, we are out of time. We're getting very close to an hour. Uh, the very thing that we talked about at the beginning of the show, <clears throat> what's the golden age of Pixar? For me, it's got to be... 06 to 11. And I'm in total agreement. Yeah. I mean, I think you guys could probably sort of hear from the way we were talking about Inside Out. Uh, or actually, Inside Out's later. It's not in there. Toy yeah. Story 3 and up. <laughs> yeah. That middle category. I think there's a strong argument to be made for the initial run for yeah. 95 to 04. And I think a lot of people would make that argument. For sure. I mean, but, any any one of them is excellent. Yeah. Because, I mean, even the last one. Like, even the last one, you, you, you still get Inside Out. You still get Coco. You get Incredibles 2. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some really good ones in there. But I think for me, I'm in agreement. It's the middle one. Just because, just because going... Ratatouille, Wally, Up, Toy Story 3 as a four is so good. It's insane. That's a crazy, crazy run. Leon so, Kirk, man. Yeah, so let us know, guys. Uh, leave your thoughts below. Tweet at us. Um, if you want to catch up with what we're doing on all platforms, as we mentioned before, Action Industries is a great way to do it. Go follow that on Instagram. Follow at Team Action Show on Twitter. There's a Facebook group and a Facebook page. I don't know if the page is like officially launched yet, but as you hear this, it probably will be up and running. Yeah, the page is up. It's, it's definitely still in the early stages of construction, but go and give it a like. It's just called Action Industries. There'll be pictures of me and Ben there. Our Facebook group pages are the Action Army Facebook fan group and also All About Action. So go find us on all all of those platforms. And I think all about action is changing to action industry soon. Probably. So, yeah. Just yeah. look out for the keyword action industries. Follow along. You'll find our stuff. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll be back same time, same place next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.